Thank you all for coming. Uh, thank Google for having me. Uh, today we're going to talk about convolutional neural networks with Swift and a little bit of Python. Uh, very broadly, we're going to explore the problem of Im image recognition. The uh, purpose of my presentation is to take you from, we'll say, zero, or about as basic as you can get in this field, all the way up to the current state of the art. So towards that end, we're going to do a quick review of neural networks, how they work. Uh, we'll look at a one-dimensional version of the MNIST problem, which is a well-understood problem in uh, computer vision. From there, we'll introduce convolutions, and then we'll tackle MNIST again using a 2D approach. From there, we'll look at how we can introduce color and start to stack our convolutions in order to uh, tackle larger problems. And then from there, we'll look at how we can take the same basic approach and add even more layers to build up to VGG, which is our first state-of-the-art approach from 2014 or so. From then, we can modify the VGG basic network to produce residual networks, which are a very powerful uh, modern approach in this field. And then at the end, we'll look at EfficientNet, which is a very recent paper in this field, and do a quick demo of running that on an edge GPU device. So here we go. Uh, very broadly, uh, these are like the four big categories of computer vision I think you should be aware of. I'll convert them into the international standard of cat and dog units. So we have I image recognition, or is this a cat or a dog picture? Object detection, or where is the cat in this picture? Image segmentation, or which pixels are cat pixels? And then finally, instance segmentation, how many sets of cat and dog pixels do we have? Uh, today we're just going to be focused on the upper left quadrant here, so just cats and dogs. Uh, neural networks. Um, neural, this field is, uh, well, machine learning has historically been focused on sort of reducing problems down to the simplest dimension, we'll say, trying to figure out if there's just one variable that changes things. And so neural networks are kind of like an outgrowth of computer science, we'll almost say. They were kind of a curiosity for the longest time. The basic trick that a neural network does is that it can learn how to separate high dimensional data. So images, we might think of them as being simple, but to machine, they're actually kind of complicated. You have a red channel, a green channel, a blue channel, a height and width component, and then you're trying to map it to some category at the end. So if you could actually just imagine for each input picture, you mapped it to a specific category, that's literally what a neural network learns. In order to do this, we often end up doing a lot of math where we do A applied to B, B applied to C, C applied to D, and so on and so forth. In order to do this, then, we use back propagation and the chain rule from calculus. Everybody hates to talk about the chain rule, and so somebody said, well, hey, why don't we have a computer keep track of all this stuff? So back in, um, auto differentiation is not really a, a new subject in this field. It's actually from the 1970s or so. Uh, what is new is combining auto differentiation with the compiler in order to model these uh, neural networks at the uh, uh, language level. So Swift isn't really magically special in and of itself. Um, this slide up here, this upper uh, right thing, is sort of a slide I stole from Chris Latner's uh, keynote presentation at LLVM Congress earlier this year. But it's basically demonstrating how all these worlds are sort of moving together. Uh, Swift's real secret power is that it was the first language of LLVM, which is a uh, modern compiler that's used almost everywhere nowadays. So basically, all these worlds are sort of coming together where you can write your high-level neural network code in your particular programming language. It'll be converted to an a intermediate language, and then finally LLVM will spit out for whatever device you actually need to run it on. So right now, people are coding stuff for CPUs and GPUs and TPUs, but a new area that's coming out is like running stuff on devices, so say on your mobile phone, or even as like an edge TPU device, as we'll see later. And so the whole theory of this project then is by getting everything to sort of follow this path, you'll be able to target all these different runtimes. So the same cloud code that you're writing can run up in the cloud or on the device in your hands. Uh, the second level of this then, and this is kind of the really new area, is this whole MLIR. So rather than having each of these languages implement their own abstract syntax for doing this neural network stuff, they're trying to sort of model it at a a cleaner level, so all these languages will generate MLIR code, and then from there we can go LLVM to your device. So right here at the bottom, 
we have some sort of the uh, different forms of basic neural networks. Uh, over here we have the perceptron. So if you can imagine an imaginary line dividing all your cats and dog pictures, that's literally what a perceptron is. And this is from 1958. This is not as new as you may think. Uh, the basic problem is like what I said, that you can't actually reduce the data down to one dimension that easily. So basically they have these sort of hidden layer approaches where you run things through a set of neurons and then that's how you get to your actual result. So pay attention to our deep feed-forward neural network and then we can add some convolutions on top because that's what we're going to do for our next two steps. Uh, so the MNIST da data set is a well understood data set in computer vision. It's a collection of hand drawn digits. They're all black and white. So these values are from 0 to 255. Um, they're 28 pixels by 28 pixels wide. So this 8 right here is just literally what one of the digits in the data set would look like. Uh, we're not even going to treat this as actual image data. What we're going to do is unroll it. So we're literally going to take the top row and then pull off each row at a time until we have a really long vector. So this second picture right here is sort of demonstrating just a four by four unrolling loop of maybe say like an imaginary one, but we can imagine the same concept across the 28 by 28 pixels to produce an input vector that's 784 uh, pixels long. So next, we're just gonna take our input vector of 784 pixels and we're gonna run it through two fully connected layers of 512 neurons and then we're gonna map it to an output layer of 10 categories, uh, the numbers zero through nine. So uh, I originally set out to write this demo, uh, but this gentleman named Juan is out in uh, uh, Mountain View. He's a GD out there, he wrote this code. So I simply took his code and modified it slightly in order to produce these results. So this is what our very simple neural network's gonna look like. It's nothing more than our input layer, 784 to 512, 512 to 512 again, and then 512 to 10 out at the end. Um, the reason we're using these Swift native data types is that means that actually now we can just uh, define our differentiation function in this simple line right here. And the compiler will take care of all the magic of actually making that happen. So let's see what this would look like. Uh, here's all the code, his actual code. He got all the way down to about 40 lines, which is quite elegant. Um, but all I did was modify this bit. Oops. Uh, so now we'll run his basic MNIST demo uh, across the MNIST data set. Uh, I'm running this on one of my, well, my computer back in Missouri, but I'm SSH'd in here. Uh, so this simple neural network is able to get about 94% accuracy on the MNIST data set. Uh, we're kind of cheating because we're using large fully connected layers, but uh, bear with me and I hope this approach will make sense. Uh, convolutions. I would love to throw one slide up here and explain to you all convolutions in one slide, uh, but I don't think that's uh, possible. Uh, but I think this slide right here, which I stole from an NVIDIA deck like a year ago, is about the best way I can try to tackle the subject. Uh, what we have on our back is sort of our input image, and then what we're gonna export is sort of a blurred version of our input image. So we have this sort of three by three convolutional kernel in the middle, and all it is is the number one. So what that means is that for each input set of three pixels, our output is simply just gonna be the sum of these pixels together. So I don't know if you can see the numbers very well, but it's literally two plus one plus two plus one plus one to get seven out. We then take this whole little window, move it over one set of pixels, and repeat the process again. Keep on going until we reach the end of the row, and then we repeat, moving everything down one row. So this process of going over the image is called striding, and this is a very important concept for you to understand. Uh, the other concept you need to understand is max pooling. So all we're going to do is take this group of 16 pixels and convert it to a set of four. And we're literally just for each colored region gonna find the largest pixel and make that be our output. So if we take these two concepts together and revisit the MNIST problem, 
we can actually uh, significantly improve our quality just by changing how we're modeling our data. So we're going to take our same 784, but we'll treat it as an actual image, so it'll be 28 by 28 pixels now. We'll run it through two layers, the three by three convolutions, a max pull operation, and then we'll keep our same densely connected layers and output of 10 categories. Uh, oops, sorry. Uh, so here's what the actual Swift code for this looks like. I've literally taken the example from before, and we've added a stack of convolutions on top. Uh, then we take our input, run it through our convolutional layer, and then send it to our uh, same output densely connected layers as before. Uh, this will run. Uh, this goes a little bit slow. I didn't quite install everything in the optimized manner. Uh, but eventually we'll run, we'll get up to about 97% accuracy on the MNIST data set. So by simply changing how we've, moder how we've modeled the data using convolutions, we would be able to cut our error in half uh, on this toy problem, we'll say. Uh, where do we go from here? Uh, Let's take on a slightly larger, more complicated problem. Uh, this is a data set called CIFAR. It's a collection of uh, color pictures. So we have pictures of cats, dogs, animals, as well as like human vehicles, so like cars and trucks. Uh, we have 10 categories. And now we're going to be working with color data. So we have a RGB component. Uh, but our same basic approach that we used for before, uh, we'll, we can scale it up to tackle this problem. So. Uh, We'll simply take our input data, 32 by 32 by three channels. Uh, we'll run it through two sets of convolutions, a max pool, two more sets of convolutions, a max pool, our same two densely connected layers, and then we'll have 10 categories for our outputs. Uh, so here's what this model looks like. And we've done nothing more, really, than add another stack of convolutions. Um, if you look at the very first line, 3 by 3 by 3 by 32, that's where we introduced color. It didn't really actually make our network that much more complicated. Um, so for this one, uh, for this one, I took the uh, CIFAR demo from the uh, Swift TensorFlow slash uh, Swift Models repository and just uh, replaced, put my model in there over that, and then we ran it. So that will look like this. Uh, we'll let it run. It'll take a while to run. Um, eventually, we'll end up with a network around somewhere around 70% accuracy, which isn't going to allow you to write a paper anytime soon, but it does like technically work, this approach. Uh, so, we, so we might look at this thing and say, well, heck, let's just keep on doing this approach. Let's stack up more and more convolutions. I think if you could jump in a time machine and go back in time five years, you could then be the world's foremost expert in computer vision. So this is the VGG network from 2014 or so. And it's nothing more complicated than the things I've shown you so far. Uh, we're dealing with the ImageNet data set. So we have a slightly lar larger input of 224 by 224 pixels. And uh, but we take our input, two layers of 3 by 3 convolutions, a max pool, two more layers of 3 by 3 convolutions. Uh, we're looking at the BGG19, so we have uh, three layers, or sorry, four layers of 3 by 3 convolutions, max pool, four layers of 3 by 3 convolutions, max pool, four layers of 3 by 3 convolutions, max pool. Uh, I'm using a slightly larger dense layer. We were using 512 for the two demos before. This one is simply 4K, 4096. And then ImageNet has 1,000 categories, so we have 1,000 uh, output nodes at the end. Um, and then, um, so yeah, so we take this, and we'll say, let's apply like one more sort of mental leap on top. Rather than think of this as being 22444, let's think that this is one set of two layers one set of two layers, two sets of two layers, two sets of two layers, and two sets of two layers. If you can do that step, 
then we can jump over here to uh, VGG, which is our first, or sorry, ResNet, which is our first uh, solid modern approach in this field. Uh, the basic, uh, so on our left side here, we have the same VGG network that we were looking at before. So 22444. In the middle, we have the background of what's called ResNet 34, but it's conceptually no more complicated than anything we've looked at thus far. We have three sets of these two three by three layers, four sets of these two three by three layers, six sets of these two three by three layers, three sets of these two three by three layers, and then we have our output layer. Uh, the magic of residual networks is this sort of dotted line that's being drawn down over here over the side. Uh, basically, uh, the problem with the VGG approach is that uh, uh, these convolutional approaches are not very resistant to noise. So it's actually about as big of a network as you can make. Uh, the problem is, we'll say, if each layer only introduces like 0.1% noise, by the time you go through 19 layers, that's going to significantly affect your results. So ResNets basically introduce this concept of skip connections. And basically then neural networks are kind of extremely lazy. So if they can find an answer, then basically they'll shortcut everything else. So the power of these residual networks then is that basically you can stack layers and layers of convolutions until you find something that sort of overfits your problem and then you can sort of dial it back to produce like a simplified, in theory, best case answer. Um, so th that then is ResNet 34. Uh, we need to do one more trick. Uh, we need to go away from our three by three convolutions. So we're gonna go from the, if we look here in this other quadrant, what we're gonna do is replace our, three by, our two three by three layers with a one by one, three by three, one by one style approach. So three and four, six and three is 16, times two is 32 plus a head and an output layer, so that's ResNet 34. Uh, the same 16 times three plus head and output is 48 plus two, so this is ResNet 50. So let's do a quick demo of training ResNet 50 on the ImageNet data set using a cloud TPU. Uh, what we'll need to do first is uh, create a cloud TPU. So that's simply running this command. I did this uh, 10 minutes ago, so we won't have to watch it uh, get started. Uh, so here we have a uh, cloud TPU running uh, up in the cloud. Uh, so. Uh, we'll start this whole process. It'll spit out a whole bunch of line noise. We'll say um, a lot of warnings about TensorFlow 2. Uh, but <laughs> um, if we wait about 10 to 12 hours, uh, this will output a uh, ResNet 50 trained on the ImageNet data set. Uh, so where do we go from here? Uh, don't let the 2015 up there fool you. Uh, this ResNet 50 is more or less probably your best first bet for most computer vision problems still today. Uh, many people have come up with different networks. Some of them are, you know, technically better or technically produce slightly better results. But more often than not, you should come back to this basic model for your first approach. Um, um, let's look at these bottleneck blocks a little bit more. Um, basically, I would argue that this 131 approach is not as powerful as the 3 by 3 approach we've looked at so far. Uh, the reason this bottleneck layer has better results is hidden in this 256 that's shown on the last layer. Uh, this 131, the last layer is technically four times as large as the other stuff. So basically, I would argue that uh, th this bottleneck layer is not as powerful as the uh, 3 by 3 approach. However, it's cheaper. So because it's cheaper, we can run more of it, and because we can run more of it, that's ultimately why this approach is, uh, produces better results. So in order to replace ResNet, we need something that's not necessarily better, we need something that's actually cheaper, or to use a slightly different word, we'll say more efficient. Um, so this is a paper that came out in May of this year. And it's a culmination of several years of research by the uh, Google team. Uh, effectively, people have 
tried to build larger networks with, people have tried to build deeper networks, and people have tried to build larger networks in terms of the size of the inputs, but nobody's really found like the perfect combination. So this paper, what they did is they took the MNAS approach from MNAS net from last year, uh, they added in some different bottle, uh, layer types from other uh, cutting edge networks, and then basically effectively they left the computer and let it search across all this parameter space in order to find the most optimal set of networks. Uh, they've done similar things this before in the past, uh, notably with NASNet and then the AmoebaNet papers from last year. Uh, but what's interesting to me about this paper is that they're uh, uh, applying sort of human intuition and logic on top. So they've literally come up with a formula whereby if you come up with one network, they can basically multiply the parameters in your network in order to produce larger uh, versions of it. So um, this is really cool, I think, because a lot of times the uh, reinforcement learning stuff, you kind of end up with networks that only computers understand, whereas this is like humans adding another layer of intuition on top, so sort of working together, we'll say. Uh, which brings us to uh, efficient net dash HTPU. Uh, we can think of our search space as being like, say, accuracy or quality of our models, uh, but we can also model our search space differently. So we can say, what is our latency? You know, how long does this network take to run? How large is our network? How many different operations are we using? How many uh, individual parameters? And so they have these edge DPU devices, which Google's been shipping out, they're like 75 bucks or so you can buy. And then they gave this efficient net thing, this edge TPU uh, hardware type, and said, produce the best type of network for this particular device. <laughs> so what happened was, is that we have sort of a one by one convolution combined for three by three convolution. And what the network found is that by combining these two together into a larger three by three convolution, you could actually produce better results in faster amount of time. So. Um, what we have up here then is our ResNet 50 model. And as you can see, sort of up here, we have what we would call the holy grail of uh, image recognition search. We have a network that's smaller, faster, and more accurate, which is all you can really ask for. Um, so what we're going to do now is demo uh, running uh, efficient net dash edge TPU dash the S variant, the one this arrow is pointing to on an actual edge TPU device. So uh, the first trick we're gonna do is we're gonna use a TPU3 instead of a TPU2. So that's in this command here. Uh, the second trick we need is that this is all a little bit bleeding edge, so we have to use a nightly build of TensorFlow, so we uh, tell the computer to do that right here. Uh, next, we have a bunch of parameters and whatnot, uh, but basically very similar to our ResNet uh, command. So here's my edge, or sorry, here's my cloud TPU V3 running. And we'll just literally copy paste the command in here. Uh, we'll give it a few seconds to get going. Okay, uh, so now we're training edge efficient net dash edge TPU dash S in the cloud on a TPU V3. Uh, this will take about 30 hours to run, uh, but at the end, we'll have produced a checkpoint. Uh, next, we'll just literally copy this checkpoint from our remote server down to my local machine. We'll skip that there. Um, uh, the edge TPU device uses N8MAF, whereas the cloud is using floating point. So we need to re convert, quantize our model. So convert from floating point into N8. Uh, so for this, uh, we'll use another script that the edge TPU people have provided. Uh, the only fun part of getting this working is that this relies on the TensorFlow XLA ops, which are not uh, installed by default in the TensorFlow builds, so you have to compile it from source. Uh, this takes about a minute or so to run. Uh, 
Uh, so this takes about a minute or so to run, and we'll have a quantized checkpoint of our efficient at dash edge, CP, edge TPU build. Then we just need to simply run uh, the device using actual local. Oh boy. Okay. Uh, then we just need to run our uh, uh, run our model locally using an actual edge TPU device. Uh, I got a picture of a panda off Wikipedia. We're using that for input. And as you can see, it thinks we have a panda with, we'll say, 60% prob probability, but it might also be a frox with 11% or 12% probability or so. Uh, so very broadly, our goal was to explore the uh, concept of convolutional neural network to perform image recognition. Uh, towards that end, we built a one-dimensional neural network. We added convolutions, and then we approached the MNIST problem again using a 2D approach. From there, we looked at how we could stack blocks up in order to tackle larger and more complicated problems in this field. Then we looked at how we could introduce residual layers, and then finally begin to actually modify our different block types in order to produce a state-of-the-art approach in this field. Uh, I've talked a lot about uh, com uh, images up here, we'll say, uh, but many of the more interesting applications of CNNs are in completely different fields. Uh, so we can add another layer on top of our 2D CNN in order to get a 3D CNN. We can use this to start to tackle uh, depth data, so like LIDAR, stuff like that. Um, people have taken language models and converted them into these CNN-style approaches. So QANet was an interesting paper from last year where they did that. Uh, planet detection, uh, they can take like a 1D CNN approach and then do some other tricks on top in order to begin to detect exoplanets. So this Astronet was a really interesting paper in this field. Uh, the AlphaFold paper came out earlier this year. Uh, they use a combination of 1D, 2D, and 3D neural networks together in order to significantly advance the state of the art in protein modeling. Um, and then finally, uh, the ever popular AlphaGo and AlphaZero engines. Um, Originally, I tried to put up a little bit of each of these papers up here, but this slide got a little bit busy, uh, but I reduced it back down to this one picture. Uh, so what you're looking at is the inner layer of the Alpha Zero engine, which is composed of 40 of these residual blocks that you're looking at right here. Uh, what I thought was interesting is that this Alpha Zero block is composed literally of a residual layer, the same approach we looked at before, with two pairs of three by three convolutions. So the same approaches that we've used to do our image recognition can, in a completely different domain, plus a whole bunch of reinforcement learning, be used to solve the game of Go. So that's all I got, and uh, thanks for coming.